Smoke alerted an officer on patrol to the fire at a shopping complex in Austin, Texas. It was shortly before midnight on Friday, December 6, 1991, when he called it into dispatch. Firefighters raced to the I Can't Believe It's Yogurt shop, focused only on putting out the flames and saving the surrounding businesses. That is, until one of the first responders saw the horrifying sight of a human foot sticking out from some debris. Immediately, police were informed that a body had been found, but before Detective Sergeant John Jones could arrive on the scene, dispatch updated him, saying, make that four bodies. In this episode of Anatomy of Murder, we will be discussing the tragic deaths of four teenage girls that became known as the Austin Yogurt Shop Murders. This episode is sponsored by Raid Shadow Legends, a badass mobile RPG that is sure to get your socks soaked. And now that I've said that, I realize it sounds weirder than I intended it to, so uh, that's cool with me still, so whatever. You must know of Raid by now. If you don't, you've probably been Patrick Starr's roommate. You know, living under a rock. <laughs> Raid is one of the highest rated mobile RPGs in the universe and for damn good reasons. It's so intensive that it plays like a console game, but it's on your phone. Your phone is significantly smaller than a console. Did you know that? <laughs> we learn something new every day here on my channel. Except I don't upload anywhere close to every day, so damn. Legit, this game has that old school feel that I personally love so much. Turn-based battles, special moves, plenty of epic champions to choose from. I mean, look at some of these characters. This one looks identical to my mother. How did they even know that? They're so crazy. The game has plenty of ways to unlock tons of new champions by breaking shards, which is satisfying AF heck. Then they got the tavern, where you could sacrifice champions in order to power up other champions and make them stronger, just like when a man eats another man. Plus, there's a fully voiced story campaign where you rush in and destroy your opponents, but you can also challenge other players if you have an inherent desire to appear superior over other people, like I do. <laughs> they also have dungeons where you fight 10 different bosses and pick up some super fresh swag like artifacts to increase the strength of your champions. And this game has so much more, not to mention it's free to play, much like my mother. All you need to do is go into the description below and check out the links to get started. Incredible graphics, daily rewards, and clans where you team up with friends to be badass together? If I could date Raid, I'd be in the back of my car making out with it right now, but I can't, so I'm gonna just have to stick to making out with my phone instead, as usual. And now, you can play Raid both on mobile and on your desktop. The game is cross-device, so you can play with the same user and switch between devices, whenever you want and however you want it, which is the best way to consume anything, am I right? Oh, the graphics are amazing in this PC version, and the game is super fast as well, not to mention it's free. You can find me on there under the name Gavigan. If you see me around, I'm probably just being my saucy little self, <laughs> but let me know. So go down to the description below and hit up a link. New players get 100,000 silver, two clan boss keys, 10 mystery shards, and one free champion named Adjudicator, which is also my mother's name. How does this game know so much about my mother? Like, check Adjudicator out. Damn. Mm. Flex it, baby. So don't miss out. Go claim your treasure. All rewards are relevant for 30 days. You also must hit on me in the comments below to qualify. <laughs> Just kidding on that last part, but you can still hit on me anyway if you want. Thanks for listening. And now, on to my mother. I mean the episode. Shit. Seventeen-year-olds Eliza Thomas and Jennifer Harbison were your average high school girls. 
both working at the I Can't Believe It's Yogurt shop in order to make some spending money. They had worked closing together many times in the past, and on the night of December 6th, the girls had an easier shift ahead of them, as Jennifer's 15-year-old sister Sarah and her 13-year-old friend Amy Ayers would be coming a few hours before shift end in order for Jennifer to drive them home for a sleepover. Sarah Harbison had celebrated her 15th birthday only five weeks before the night of the murders. She was a junior varsity cheerleader and raised lambs for the Travis County Livestock Show and Rodeo. Her older sister was also an avid athlete. Jennifer was the manager of her high school drill team as well as a member of the track team. 17-year-old Eliza loved to read and dance. Her mother believed she would be a writer someday. The youngest of the teens, Amy, was still in middle school. She was active on the yearbook staff and skillfully creative. She had won the arts and crafts division at the local fair with her needlepoint. All four girls were friendly with each other. They were members of the Future Farmers of America and were known to be animal lovers, with both Eliza Thomas and Amy Ayers even wanting to be veterinarians in the future. These bright and energetic teens were well-loved in their community. The loss of those young lives and the sheer depravity of their last night alive would shake Austin even to this day. When recounting the crime scene, Detective Mike Huckabay said it was dark inside, smoky, burned insulation everywhere, just the cold feeling of death. The lead detective, John Jones, was equally shaken. He commented by saying, for a long time I shut out what I saw, just wholesale carnage. We knew immediately that they were kids. The girls were found in the prep area of the store. Two were stacked on top of each other, while another girl was found nearby. It's believed that the third victim had also been stacked with the other girls, but was knocked loose due to the water pressure from the hoses while fighting the fire. As the debris covering their bodies was removed, the viciousness of the crimes became apparent. Their legs were spread, and it was clear that the girls had been sexually assaulted. An ice cream scoop found between Sarah's legs had also been used in the sexual assault. She was naked and severely charred. She had been gagged and her hands were bound behind her back with a pair of panties. Sarah died from a shot through the back of the head. A 22 caliber bullet was later recovered from her brain. Jennifer's naked body was not bound, but she was discovered with her hands behind her back her bindings likely having been destroyed in the fire. She was shot through the back of the head with a 22 caliber weapon as well. Jennifer had suffered the most damage from the fire. She could only be identified during her autopsy. Eliza's naked body was found much in the same way as the other girls. She had been bound, gagged, and shot in the back of the head, also with a 22. Due to her burns, it was unclear if Eliza had been sexually assaulted, but it was likely she had suffered the same fate. The only one of the teens who was found separately was 13-year-old Amy. It's theorized that she continued to struggle even after being shot in the head with the 22 and had dragged herself away from her attackers. She had a sock-like material tied around her neck and it was determined during her autopsy that she had been manually strangled, but not fatally. She also suffered a strike to the face as she had a mark on her lower lip. Amy was the least harmed in the fire, but she still suffered third-degree burns to nearly 30% of her body. She had two contact gunshot wounds, one on the top left side of her head and the other behind her left ear. The first was caused by the 22, but did not enter her brain like the other victims. The second gunshot wound was caused by a 380 that passed through the brain and exited through Amy's cheek and jawline. Horrifyingly, Amy was still alive when first responders arrived, however, she soon succumbed to her extensive injuries and died in the yogurt shop along with the other girls. When firefighters arrived on the scene, the front door of the store had been locked, but the back door was propped open. Detectives would later learn that this was highly unusual. 
as at no point did the girls have any reason to open that door. An arson investigator for the Austin Fire Department initially concluded that the fire had been started on the shelves in the storage area and then had spread up the wall, across the ceiling, and down the opposite wall. This conclusion would severely hamper the case. First responders reported no scent of an accelerant, and with the assumption that the ignition point had been the shelf, meant the scene was never tested for any sort of accelerant. It would be eight years later when a special agent of the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms reviewed the photographic evidence. Based on his analysis of the burn patterns, the damage to the girls' bodies, and the relative amount of damage to other items in the area, he concluded that the perpetrators had directly set fire to the bodies of the victims. The autopsy report also revealed an enormously high BTU output, indicating the probable use of gasoline to burn the bodies. The destruction caused not only by the fire, but also by the efforts to put out the blaze left investigators with very little in the way of evidence, as well as the mistakes in understanding how the fire was set further complicated the investigation. Despite all the difficulties facing them, they weren't willing to give up. Detective Jones called in the assistance of other agencies like ATF in order to chase down every available lead. They would relentlessly pursue justice for the innocence that was lost that night. Putting together the details of that December night proved a challenge for Detectives Jones and Huckabay. Within the first two years of the investigation, near 5,000 leads were looked into by the task force, none leading to an arrest. A public plea was made for anyone who had visited the yogurt shop that day to speak to police. One customer of the shop happened to be a former officer named Daryl Croft. Somewhere between 9.30 and 10 p.m. on the night of the 6th, Daryl came into the shop to get yogurt for himself and two friends. While there, he noticed a suspicious individual who had been lingering in the shop for some time. The man was wearing a military fatigue-style jacket and allowed customer after customer to go ahead of him in line. When the stranger spoke to Croft, he asked if he was a cop. This further raised Daryl's suspicions, so he refused to go ahead of the man in line. When the suspicious individual finally approached the counter, the man only ordered a soda, and after he paid, went around the counter and disappeared into the back room. Daryl asked where the man had gone, and Eliza replied that she had allowed the man to use the restroom. Feeling uneasy, Croft lingered even after his order was ready, however the man never re-emerged from the back of the store and eventually Daryl left. The individual in the military jacket has never come forward and has never been identified. Another set of customers who came forward with information was a married couple who arrived at the yogurt shop not long before 11 p.m., the time at which the store closed. They stated that they saw two young men seated in a booth near the counter, both drinking sodas and not eating yogurt. As it was close to the end of the night, Eliza and Jennifer had long since begun cleaning up the store. Investigators noted that the chairs in the store were stacked atop tables, napkin dispensers were refilled, in fact, all the tables and booths had been cleaned, all that is, except for the one where the men were seated. These individuals also have never been identified or have come forward. At one point, the task force had 342 suspects and as many as 50 confessions for the crime. One such confession was by Kenneth Allen McDuff, a notorious Texas serial killer. Also known as the Broomstick Murderer, McDuff was convicted of killing three teenagers and had repeatedly sexually assaulted his female victim before breaking her neck with a broomstick. Despite the similarity in the crime, McDuff was ruled out as DNA did not match any of the samples from the yogurt shop murders. Another confession was by Carlos Saavedra. According to the Mexican police, Saavedra confessed to the November 1991 sexual assault of an Austin woman as well as to the yogurt shop murders. Authorities located and arrested Carlos Saavedra and Alberto Cortez in Mexico in October of 1992. 
The two men were tried and convicted. However, they were later released from custody when Saavedra recanted the confession. It was then discovered his interrogation by Mexican police involved the use of a Coke bottle filled with water and cayenne pepper, which was poured down his nose until he confessed. Saavedra denies any knowledge of who killed the girls. As more time passed and with no conclusion in sight, the chances of finding who was truly responsible for killing four innocent teenagers seemed less and less likely. In a sea of potential leads and confessions, frustration would begin to grow. It seemed no matter their efforts, the detectives continued to come up empty. For several years, the task force chased down every possible lead. They went after Satanists and serial killers alike. However, as more and more time passed, the task force shrunk, and eventually even Detective Jones was promoted and the case passed on from his care. As the investigation fell into new hands, it would take another tragic turn due to a severe miscarriage of justice. Next time on Anatomy of Murder, forced confessions, coercion with a weapon, and even another death will be linked to this truly horrific case. Be sure to subscribe, turn on notifications, and watch for part two of the Austin Yogurt Shop Murders. Thank you for watching.